Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, join this event today. The Midlands Combined Authority are very kindly putting on a series of webinars talking about different career opportunities in the region. Um, thank you very much for your time today and for joining us. I really hope that in the next 60 minutes or so that we'll be able to inspire some of you to uh, consider taking up healthcare careers. My name is Anne Clark, and I am one of the regional directors for Skills for Health. Skills for Health is an organization that focuses on working with employers to maximize um, the workforce and to address their workforce challenges. So we help them ensure that the training they provide is high quality, that the roles that they offer and the careers that they can provide are exciting and interesting and stimulating. And that I suppose above all, that they provide the highest possible quality care for patients and patients' families. Um, there are lots and lots of roles, um, 350 I believe in total in the health sector. So there really is something for everybody. There are roles in estates, for example, you can be a painter or a plumber or a gardener. You can be a hospital chaplain. You can work in clinical roles. We all know nurses and doctors, but there are many, many other clinical roles and support worker roles. You can work in housekeeping. You can be a cook. There are multiple, multiple opportunities. And I really hope that over the next 60 minutes, um, you'll, you'll find something that inspires you and appeals to you. Um, on entry, many jobs don't require qualifications um, and employers will provide those, the training and the qualifications that you need. So um, I hope that you'll be inspired, whether you're a school leaver or somebody that's been impacted by the pandemic or somebody who's considering a changing career. We've got a really exciting lineup of speakers today um, and I will introduce each of them. We have some real um, experts who will give you their um, advice and guidance and talk a little bit about their own experiences. And to kick us off, um, we have a short message from Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands. Andy couldn't be with us today, but he wanted to send a few words for you all to listen to. So I'll just pass you over to Andy. Hello, Andy Street, Mayor of the West Midlands here. And thank you to those of you who joined us this morning for the webinar on social care. As I said, we're going this afternoon to come to the healthcare sector. Should again start off with the thanks that, of course, on this occasion goes to Anne for pulling all this together, to our sponsors, but most importantly to you for participating. And as we said this morning, uh, we know the West Midlands economy has taken a big hit from COVID, but there are opportunities for new jobs in the growing sectors. And of course, we know that the healthcare sector has incredible responsibility on its shoulders, but also it does have new opportunities for really fulfilling careers. So what this is all about today is looking at exactly what roles there could be available. And when you stand back from the healthcare sector, you actually think there's a myriad of roles available. It's pretty much the biggest employer in the country. You think of all the different jobs. Yes, we've uh, applauded the frontline workers, but we should also think about everybody else who makes up the success of the NHS and indeed other parts of the healthcare sector. So there's the porters, there's the receptionists, there's the administrators, the employment advisors, the cleaners, everybody, the caterers, everybody who makes up the uh, healthcare sector. So I hope what you will find today is something that you think, yeah, that might be where I can be inspired. If you do, please do use the links, get in touch, and we can make sure we follow it up. But thanks again, Anne, for putting this together, and I hope everyone enjoys the webinar this afternoon. That was a great message from Andy. Um, I just wanted to highlight that my organisation over the last four or five years has offered an annual awards. We call them the Our Health Hero Awards. Um, 
their national awards. We host an event, annual event in London. Um, last year was at the Science Museum. And these are specifically aimed at recognizing those people who are, who are perhaps not on the front line. They're the people that work behind the scenes to make the health service work. Um, and so they're very dear to my heart and we're very passionate about supporting the awards. So you never know, you might be a future award winner. Um, so I'd like to now introduce our first speaker. Um, it's Maddie White, and Maddie is a colorectal nursing team leader working at University Hospital Birmingham. So over to you, Maddie. Thanks, Anne. Well, good morning, or good afternoon, rather, to everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and join you today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be asked to come and um, share my experiences um, of my nursing career. Can I have my first slides up, please? So we all recognise that the COVID um, pandemic has had a massive impact upon the health service. But one of the um, aspects of, of my role has been to help to coordinate care around um, those patients that are still able to receive treatment, despite us being under incredible pressure with something that we've never experienced before. Are my slides there? I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. So for those of you um, out there who are maybe considering to, um, coming into nursing as a career, then I would say that it's a, a, a very, very valuable career. And there are many ways into um, nursing and that, you, that you know, there are opportunities for you to both um, come in on a practical level, but also from an academic point of view as well. I've spent 35 years um, building up my career and working hard within um, the hospitals within the Midlands, mainly at the university hospitals, but have developed my career along the way, which has allowed me to uh, both develop personally, but also to become um, a leader of services within, within a huge organisation like University Hospitals Birmingham. I think there's a bit of a, a loss with my slides. The bottom line, though, is after 35 years, you know, I, I absolutely love my job. I get up every morning thinking, what today, what challenge is going to bring me today? And every day there is a new challenge. We learn all the time. And after 35 years, I can't profess knowing everything there is about nursing. But I do know that within the, the um, sector that I have chosen personally to um, nurse in, that I have learned um, skills and, and, have, and have got knowledge, thank you, and have got knowledge which make me an expert in my field. Now, I came into nursing when I was 18, so I left school knowing that I wanted to be a nurse and applied to um, a large trust, which was outside of my um, area where I lived. But I wanted that challenge of being away from home, which was brand new for me at 18, but also to be able to work for somebody that had a good reputation. Next slide, please. So why? Why did I choose nursing? Well, the patients are why I chose nursing. The patients are at the heart of everything we do. We deliver care and we want to always maintain a very good level of service, but we want to be the best always at what we do. There is a choice of pathways within nursing. So once you've qualified as a nurse, then there are pathways that you can choose, whether it be a clinical pathway, which is the one I chose. I wanted to stay looking after my patients. But some nurses do go into management structures, so they might perhaps move away from the clinical field, but go into man the management side of nursing, which is also vitally important. But there's also some nurses who will choose to go into education and will lecture in universities and colleges so that they're actually delivering that baseline care and knowledge to people like yourselves who maybe want to apply for nursing and come in and take that on. But there's also opportunities within research and development Behind the scenes of what we do, there, is a, there are massive um, research de uh, departments, both within the universities and the colleges and the hospitals themselves. So for some of you, if research is your bag, then that might be um, something that you choose to do, which is very rewarding. But there's always the opportunity to be innovative. And that's what we want to see in nursing. We want to see candidates come along who've got ideas about how to take nursing forward. 
We're very much governed by the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and that is our statutory body. So we have um, standards and protocols that we have to adhere to. And for me personally, I've joined the Royal College of Nursing and that supports me. Next slide. So when I look back at my achievements, you'll need to click these as they come in. So I'm a registered nurse and that took me three years to do my registered nurse training. I've now got um, a master's in advanced nursing practice, but I started off doing um, a diploma and then uh, a bachelor uh, with honours in nursing. But I've also now, after 35 years, I've, I've achieved the, um, I've been the chair of a national organisation within my healthcare field for the last five years. Next one. I'm a clinical expert, so the years that I've spent in my field, which is bowel care nursing and stoma care nursing, that I'm regarded as a clinical expert because I have that experience behind me, but also because I lead with, by being the chair of the national organisation. Next one. But there are other aspects to my role as a, as a nurse specialist. You have um, several remits, not just a clinical expert, but I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher, I'm used as a consultant and I'm a counsellor. So all of these skills I have learned over the last 35 years and built up so that my portfolio um, is, is filled with achievements that are all pertinent to my career. Next one. So you can see that for many nurses, when they reach the, um, well, the, uh, the people who are as old and as mature as me, who are sometimes classed as being a bit of a dinosaur, actually those 35 years have left us being multi-talented and we can turn our hands to most things, including this winter I've been um, doing the flu vaccinations and I'm sure we will get roped into doing COVID vaccinations as well. So we have many strings to our bows. Next slide. But it's not just about my role and my team. We actually work as very, very much as part of a, a multidisciplinary team. So in, in healthcare and in hospital nursing, there are many, many different varieties of health professional. There are social workers, there are surgeons, there are teachers, dieticians, psychologists, play therapists in the children's hospital. And all of these people contribute to the patient. The patient and their family are at the heart of everything we do. And we will need to draw in different skills of different people in order to, to provide a holistic service of nursing and actually meet the needs of the patient. And that's all of their needs. So we don't just go in there to be a nurse. We actually end up being more of um, uh, a key worker in that we pull all of these people in, but have the patient at the heart of what we do. Next slide, please. So an MDT is a multidisciplinary team way of working, and it's about advanced communication and collaboration. So our, our, our communication skills need to be really very advanced and very highly um, practiced in order to be able to deal with patients such as our cancer patients, for instance. If we think about our patients with um, cancer, um, they, are, they have many, many needs in terms of their psychological needs and their um, needs, needs to be met du during their treatments. Treatments can be very prolonged. They can go through having a, a diagnosis for which they need support. They go through having um, treatments such as surgery and they need information about that. But it's about coordinating that cart care so that their appointments are scheduled um, on time, that they're not left waiting without knowing what's going on. Pathways of care might include patients going on to have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and we support them through all of those pathways. So different issues will arise for different patients at different times. So to have good communication skills is really vital. But we share good practice. So within my trust, the, there are four hospitals. So those four hospitals provide patients with um, care and treatment um, on many levels. So for example, I'm at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and we provide very specialist services there, such as patients having liver transplants and cardiac surgery. But there are other hospitals within the organization who also specialize in different particular fields. But across the board, 
for hospitals, we need to work as one trust. So we try to standardise our care and our protocols and our practice so that they're equitable across the four sites. In doing all of this, we learn new skills from each other. We learn from other disciplines. And I think working in a, a large organisation such as I do, which is a, a world-renowned um, organisation, uh, you learn from other disciplines who are out there doing international research, for instance, but who bring things back, new information and new ways of working. And it's really very exciting. And I think we're very privileged to be able to work with um, esteemed colleagues who have got international reputations and actually are working at that huge strategic level. Next slide, please. So as I said before, the patient is at the heart of what we do. The patient and their families rely on us for many, many things. We are key workers. We are the, the hub and, of, uh, of, the, um, of the wheel, if you like, that we can coordinate care amongst all of these professions. But it's about what we provide patients with. It's not about just access to care, but it's about information and education around the systems, the protocols, the ways of working, the systems we work in, as well as about the disease they've got and the treatment that they're going to need. So that coordination and integration of care can carry over into the community, for instance. So we might need to liaise with people like the GP or district nurses um, or other agencies, care agencies out there, such as hospices. A lot of what we do with our cancer patients, for instance, is about emotional support and supporting them through that diagnosis and any progression of their disease. And as much as we want to, as the patient wants us to, we will involve the family and friends so that they are all supported. It's about their physical needs, but it's also about their psychological needs. And we respect the patient's preferences. They, co they, they dictate which way we, we deliver care and how we, we, we communicate with them. So we like to be able to think that we can provide some continuity and transition of care across all the pathways. Next slide. So if we look back 200 years ago, Florence Nightingale, it's her 200th year anniversary this year. And if she, she actually stipulated what qualities a professional nurse needs. And it's a huge mix. And I'm sure that as many could, um, we could probably add the same number of, of skills and, and qualities again. But if you feel that you've got some of those qualities and you think that nursing is going, is going to be the, the career for you, then there are many opportunities. If you want to go in on an academic level, then you can apply to a university to do a degree course, um, which will allow you um, the ability to actually learn about the um, about nursing within a university environment, but also have opportunities then to be have placements on wards where you will learn the skills and the art of nursing. If you prefer to have a more clinical routine, then um, you can apply for a nursing associate post by having been a healthcare assistant in, the, in, in, a, in an organisation to begin with. And that's very much about um, learning on the job, if you like. And for some people, that's a much easier way of learning. So they're already based within a, a ward and are part of that ward, but then go to university one day a week. I did my degree and my master's that way. So I'd been in nursing for many years before I took on my, um, my, diplo uh, my diploma followed by my degree and then eventually my master's. And I did it over a period of time um, that allowed me to continue to develop my career and build up my skills, um, but spending time at university as well. Next slide. So, Nurses are very much seen as being at the heart of healthcare, and I think you'll probably agree that over the last six to eight months with the national pandemic that nurses have been seen as being very much a vital part of that front worker um, organisation so that nurses are there to provide for patients and for their relatives. And I think you'll also agree that the public really um, applaud nurses for that, and that's not a reason to say that's, that makes me great. That is the way that the, the, the public have shown how much they appreciate good nurses who care for their relatives and can be relied upon. So it's just really to take this opportunity to say, um, for people who are interested in nursing, go and find out where you want to be, which way you want to go into nursing. There are always vacancies. It's a career for life, but there are huge opportunities once you are in there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Maddy. Um, you've clearly had a very uh, a fabulously interesting and fulfilling career, and it's fantastic to hear your story. Um, for people who are listening in, there are four main fields of nursing. Um, Maddie is clearly working in adult care, but there's also um, you can specialise as a children's nurse or as a mental health nurse or working with people with learning disabilities. So there really is a full range of different careers in the nursing profession for um, addressing your, your, your personal interests. Um, thank you again, Maddie. That was brilliant. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, um, Sally Johnson is the NHS Futures Manager at NHS Wolverhampton. Over to you, Sally. Thank you, Anne. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Anne said, I'm Sally Johnson and I'm the manager at the um, NHS Futures team. Um, at Royal Wolverhampton, we, my role basically and my team's role is to make sure we give everyone as much opportunities as possible to experience what life's like in the health service and see if that's the job they want and if it is, gives them support to get there. So I first of all just wanted to touch on um, why you would choose the NHS. So next slide please. So the NHS, some of this has been touched on already, it is the fifth largest employer in the world. And when you think how tiny our little island is, that's pretty impressive. We employ over 1.7 million people um, and there are over 350 different roles within the NHS. Um, the nursing, the doctors, all the clinical jobs are really important, but there's so many other jobs there. that, And these nurses, doctors couldn't do their jobs without the support that happens in the background. Um, so next slide, please. So we do think um, NHS, uh, when I go to career stands, people all just walk straight past me. Oh, no, I don't want to be a nurse. And I want, oh, come over, talk to me. What do you want to do? And they might be interested in engineering or something like that. It's like, well, you can do that with us. Um, so what you need to think about with the NHS is that it's like a small town or a community. Um, and it needs lots and lots of different roles and people to be able to function effectively seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, and that involves a small army of people, to be to be quite frank. Um, we need to keep everybody safe, we need to keep them warm, we need to keep them fed and clean and in very well maintained buildings. Um, so we need to ensure things like life saving equipment is working from blood pressure machines to MRI scanners. Uh, we need to have water fully on tap and hot and safe and oxygen all needs to be flowing through all the time. So that's keeping the building working and, and being patients be able to be looked after that way. But we also need people that can buy the equipment for us. So we need people to buy and source food, face masks. You heard all about the problems with PPE. People were working to try and get that in for our staff. Um, it might be foot support, it might even be fridges, the store in medication or for the staff to keep their sandwiches in, whichever it may be. Um, we need all these things sourced for us and we need those bills to be paid so you have people in finance. Um, we also need people in the hospital that do deal with our patients but aren't classed as clinical, so uh, moving our patients around our quarters um, and those that keep the data and IT safe so we can always access the information for our patients. We have people that work in media, um, um, helping to get the, the information out to both staff and to patients. Um, we have people in all denominations and faith. Could you move on to the slide please, There's some of the pictures will come up then. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier on about chaplains. We have numerous people that work within the NHS and each, each trust, um, which will be there for patients and staff at any time of crisis or need from different denominations that they can just go and have a chat to um, and offer support comfort to everybody. Um, we have receptionists that will meet and greet people um, and ensure our records are all up to date. Uh, we even employ photographers, people wouldn't think about photographers within the, within the NHS. Now they not only sort of create all our nice glossy brochures, um, but they will also be involved in operating theatres and around in the wards taking photographs of injuries maybe for court proceedings or um, new and exciting experimental in, um, surgery so they can share that worldwide with people. So you might have an operation happening in Wolverhampton and someone in China is looking at it and they're sharing that and our photographers and videographers would be involved in that. So as you can see from the picture, we've got so many people, I think on there, there's porters, the security staff, both our cyber and our physical, all our maintenance people, we've got mechanics. Um, we have to have people that keep the ambulances running and all our equipment running. So if it's a job you fancy and something you think you would do in the wider world, why not look at the NHS? Um, as somewhere to work. Next slide, please. 
So, talked about all the jobs that you can do. Um, the NHS has a very particular set of standards uh, and we look for people that have those standards because patient care is at our very, very heart of whatever we do. And you may think, well, if I'm um, doing the cleaning or I'm doing the finance, how does that impact on patient care? Well, it does because everything that we do is a cog that keeps the wheels turning that makes provide excellent patient care. So if you have these qualities or these values that are um, on the screen now, um, then absolutely have a look at um, the NHS to apply. Um, so you feel you've got all these beliefs, but what are the benefits? Why would you work for the NHS and not go and work for um, a private company? Next slide, please. Let's have a look at some of the benefits that we've got. Um, as Maddie said, um, it is a job for life. Once, you, once, once you're in, you're in. There aren't many people that get out of the NHS. You see people doing different trusts maybe in different areas, but it is very much that once you're there, it's such a family that everybody tends to stay, um, even if they do move around the country. So some of the benefits I've listed, um, monthly salary, you know every month on a, depending on what day, normally towards the end of the month, and that will match your ability and your responsibilities. There's very clear pathways as well for opportunity for you to be able to move either up or across the ladder. Lots of people expand. It's local work. You're not going to have to get up and travel at half past three in the morning to get to your job somewhere else. It's always within your local area. There's hospitals, there's care centres. They're all within good bus routes to be able to get to where you need to go. Um, great annual leave because we all need a break. Um, so it starts at 27 days and increases up to 33 after 10 years service. Um, and a standard working week of 37 and a half hours, but with flexible working. So you can split that over different hours. Some people might do three very long shifts in a week. Other people will split it into all mornings, whatever it is that we can sort that out for you. We have a great pension scheme. Many of you might not even be considering pension schemes at the moment, but when you get to my age, it's very important to start thinking about that. Um, and it's nice to know that you've got that, that sort of in our, our old age, we've got a little bit of money to come to us. We contribute a lot to it, but it's very well supported as well. Um, pay enhancements, so if you're working shift hours or overtime working. Um, what generally also makes a good healthcare worker can also make them quite vulnerable to um, suffering with mental ill health or, or being a bit um, vulnerable uh, because we're very caring people. So we have excellent occupational health and counselling services available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that's also for physical health. Um, whether you get injured outside of work, you can get straight through to physiotherapy and things like that. Um, I've mentioned about the pay and we always always have an annual development review as well where your manager will sit with you and go okay this is what you've done this year where do you see yourself next year or where do you see yourself in five years times and they will make a plan with you to be able to move to where you want to go so some really good um, reasons for working within the NHS there. Next slide please. So we've talked about the benefits now I'm going to sell my trust a little bit well Wolverhampton Hospital um, as I say I think it's a great place to work um, it is the largest employer in Wolverhampton uh, we cover over 10,000 staff uh, I think it's quite recently sometime this year we celebrated our 10,000 staff joining us um, and that covers three sites across New Cross um, in Wensfield, West Park and Cannock Chase Hospitals we also manage um, at least 10 surgeries it might be more than that now we're getting lots of GP surgeries to come and be well. So we have that really continuity of care for all our patients. Um, I think if we can have the video now, please, that would be great. This video just shows you a little bit about what it's like to work at Royal Wolverhampton and, and why choose.
Thank you, Sally. That was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed the uh, the video at the end there. And I like the emphasis on teamwork and, and being part of a community. I've been in the health sector myself for 25 years and uh, yeah, you absolutely do feel that. Um, so we're running a little tiny bit behind. So without any further ado, um, I will pass you, I'll pass over to Jason. Um, Jason, I believe you're dialing in, so we can't see you, but I hope you're there. I am, yes, thank you. Yeah, apologies, I've had a, a few technical issues this morning, um, but yeah, glad to be able to dial in, so hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, just by way of an introduction, um, my name's Jason Wright, I'm the I'm Operations Manager for the Prince's Trust Health and Social Care Programmes um, across the West Midlands, so including areas like Coventry, Black Country, Birmingham, Stafford, St Staffordshire and Stoke, etc. Um, I'm sure most people are perhaps familiar with the Prince's Trust, but just by way of a little bit of um, introductory background, um, the Prince's Trust was founded in 1976 by the Prince of Wales, um, really at a time of a bit of a backdrop really of high unemployment and unfortunately a, a lot of rioting across some of the major cities in the UK. Um, and at that point, um, His Royal Highness had finished his service with the Royal Navy um, and became interested in really improving the lives of young people who are perhaps experiencing disadvantage. Um, and he founded the Prince's Trust to deliver on that commitment. Um, the Prince's Trust does that really through programmes which um, integrate things like work placements, class-based learning and interviews to give young people practical, practical skills and knowledge to, to get a job in the future. Um, in terms of our um, work in hospitals and health and social care, working with the NHS, etc., and private providers. We've been delivering a hospital programme for approximately 10 years now. Um, and in 2019, the Department of Health and Social Care awarded the Trust uh, a significant grant to scale up this delivery. Um, so we're in the first year of a four-year contract in terms of our health and social care programmes. And essentially, we offer free programmes to young people aged 16 to 30, uh, really to provide opportunities for them to build confidence um, and develop skills uh, needed for jobs in the sector. Um, and much like um, Sally, who worked with closely at Royal Wolverhampton, um, it's a range of roles. So it's not just the clinical nursing roles, although that will be of interest to some people. Um, but it is around some of those other functions that support the day-to-day -day running of hospitals, whether that be business administration, uh, non-clinical services, customer services, portering, drivers, facilities, finance, um, lots and lots and lots of different routes in. At the Trust, we have um, a suite of programmes that young people are able to access in terms of um, routes into health and social care. Um, most long-standing of those programmes is our Get Into programmes in health and social care. Typically, these last for about four to six weeks, um, and they're an in-depth programme which uh, focuses on increasing really young people's chances of securing employment. Um, and it's a combination of class-based learning and hands-on work placements. Um, as you can imagine, um, this model has had to be slightly adapted for the current climate and COVID. Um, and unfortunately, we're not able to work with the full uh, range of partners that we were able to um, at the back end of last year. Um, but we are still working with a number of hospital trusts, a couple of which are on the call today, so UHB and Royal Wolverhampton. Um, and these are great opportunities for young people. and. Um, we, we run celebration events at the end of those programmes and it's always fantastic to see um, young people talking about their experiences, what they've learned, um, how it's the, the impact it's had on their kind of, I suppose, aspirations and attitudes um, and uh, how they see their, their future um, career prospects. So these programmes in particular are designed for young people who, who need that little bit of additional work experience to give them that confidence and routine. Um, and it involves a taste of day, to get an insight into the programme, some practical hands-on activities, some personal and social development work, um, 
some work around employability skills. So looking at, um, as Sally again mentioned earlier, in terms of the values and attitudes that are required in terms of working within this sector. Um, and the opportunity to gain some some relevant qualifications and uh, exper uh, accreditations as well, whether that be through something like uh, a dementia awareness course or a first aid certificate. So opportunity to leave with some real tangible, um, not just experience, but qualifications that obviously can add to anybody's CV and demonstrate, I suppose, their, their commitment and passion for a career in this sector. Um, as I mentioned, it's a bit of a, um, a slightly different landscape at the moment. In, in years gone by, all of these programmes would have had perhaps a four-week placement on site in a clinical or non-clinical role. We're having to slightly adapt that, and at the moment, some of that some, we are able to deliver with some hospitals face-to-face. -face. Others, it's a more blended approach with an element of virtual um, learning as well. So that's the first of our kind of um, programs of support and uh, get into offer. A second offer is a program called Get Started um, and this is a, a more short intense format um, to help overcome barriers to employment and it works really with people that are perhaps closer to the workplace um, that are, are really geared up and ready to, to um, move into employment in health and social care but perhaps need just a little bit more support um, to get across the line and in this model um, we work over a couple, over a three day period first two days um, are looking at CVs, um, employability skills, values, attitudes required for working in the sector and then we also work with a range of delivery partners as well who've got um, current live vacancies uh, and they can be with private health and social care providers, maybe residential homes, etc., cetera, um, and also with hospitals as well. And the final day of that programme is an um, opportunity to interview with a number of employers um, with a view to then a follow-up interview with those employers um, and obviously an opportunity for those young people to gain experience um, through that process um, and apply for live vacancies. We currently deliver that programme on a monthly basis um, and we've got that timetabled in uh, monthly up until the end of March and it's likely to continue in that vein moving forwards. Um, the third and, and final kind of support mechanism that we provide is mentoring support and this is really one-to-one -one coaching, um, very much tailored to individuals um, and very much looking, I suppose, geared towards those young people who are very much work ready um, and just need help finding and preparing for that right opportunity for themselves. Um, this is provided by um, our, our Health and Social Care um, Princess Trust Executives, but also we work with a range of mentors as well um, and train, uh, we, we, we recruit and train mentors to work with participants um, really to give that dedicated support and, and motivation, as I say, to support those very close to their workplace. Um, just to get over the line. Um, and that's, that's the Prince's Trust, really, in terms of our offer um, and how we, how we might be able to assist 16 to 30 year olds um, who are looking to work in the health and social care sector. Thank you very much, Jason. That's fantastic. And um, I know the great work that the Prince's Trust does supporting young people across the country and, and helping them into careers. So that's really good to hear the information. Um, I should have said at the beginning of the, the session that if you have any questions at all for any of our speakers or about any of the information that you hear, um, yeah. please do pop it in the chat box and um, the team at West Midlands Combined Authority will pick up um, those questions after the webinar and they'll respond via their web page. So please um, don't, you know, please be encouraged to put any questions at all into the chat box. Um, moving on then, um, I'm delighted now to introduce Maureen Huggins. Uh, Maureen is a renal admin support worker at University Hospital Birmingham. Over to you, Maureen. Thank you. Hello, my name's Maureen and I've recently completed a level two business admin apprenticeship 
with the University Hospitals Birmingham Trust. Just to give you a little bit of a background, after 30 years experience in secretarial admin roles and following a four year break in my career to help care for my ailing parents, I was inspired by the support the NHS gave my parents at hospitals and in the community to give something back after they both sadly passed away in recent years. I came across the NHS Health Careers website, which led me to the NHS Jobs website, where you can straightforwardly search and apply for jobs based on different criteria and at all levels. Once I completed an online application, I was able to save it as a profile and adapt it for future applications. I found the links to advice on making an application and attending interviews very useful. I also received support from the National Career Service, who provided an action plan and follow-up calls to see how I was progressing. However, after attending a few interviews, rightly or wrongly, I came to the conclusion that perhaps experience in an NHS setting may have given me a better chance of success. My confidence began to dip, but my motivation didn't. And during my search, I came across a support secretary apprenticeship and made some inquiries with that particular hospital. The first question I asked was if the apprenticeship was just for younger people. And the reply that they were now open to any age group put me on the first rung of the ladder of my NHS apprenticeship journey. I also applied for an apprenticeship at the University Hospital Birmingham and was invited to an assessment at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The educators were welcoming and informative and the group assessments helped put me at ease. I was then shortlisted for an interview and again, although this was a formal setting, the interviewer's approach was very friendly, which helped keep the nerves at bay. My interview led to an offer of a four week trial with the renal outpatients department and the renal hub at the QE. I was assigned line managers and worked with coordinators and clerks across two sites of the speciality. It's a very busy department, but the line managers set me a timetable and I took part in a rota which included shadowing staff and carrying out admin work on prepping forms for clinics, dealing with emails, working on the outpatients desks, booking and rescheduling appointments, taking calls and messages, working with a receptionist on the ward, attending multidisciplinary team meetings and other varied and interesting tasks within the department. The trial was a very useful introduction to help both the department and myself see if a possible apprenticeship was a good fit for both parties. I was so pleased when at the age of 51, I was one of a group confirmed a place on a 15 month apprenticeship. There was an induction for all new staff from different roles within the trust, which was really informative and set the groundwork of what the trust expected from its employees. In the days following, there was training on software programs used and being issued with ID and access badges, all of which steps to help you feel part of the apprenticeship in the NHS. At the forefront of training and working at the NHS is the patient being the most important person and how the trust values are, are applied in all aspects of working at the trust. There was a timetable of training workshops to attend throughout the apprenticeship. These workshops usually followed a format of training in the morning where we were encouraged to participate, comment and take notes. The educators were brilliant at making the topics interesting. In the afternoon, we researched and made a start on completing the workbook for that day's workshop. In the workbooks, we were required to give examples of how we applied the topics at our workplace departments and where required how the trust values are also incorporated. This was a great opportunity as well to utilise and stretch our IT skills with formatting and illustrations, which all helped to enhance our workbooks and improve our skills. The apprenticeship itself has the benefit of training via both the working environment and study workshops, which included assignments covering employee rights and responsibilities, health and safety, equality and diversity, teamwork, providing admin services, 
safeguarding and prevent. And I was also able to update my maths and IT qualifications. I've been able to incorporate what I've learnt on these study days in my working environment, which enhances my personal performance and I enjoyed researching examples to support my studies. With regard to the renal department, I've been fortunate to work along really encouraging line managers and colleagues who want to make sure you're doing the things right. And even when the journey has been a bit bumpy, they've always sought to support you resolve, learn, adapt and move on from any issues. I've learned and gained knowledge on so much in respect of confidentiality and respect of patients in their records and the importance of ensuring accuracy in documents, a valuable insight into the workings of a different of different aspects of an NHS department, respect between staff within the department, whether it be nursing, team, housekeepers, doctors and admin staff, and the importance of teamwork to ensure the patient comes first respecting and celebrating each other's differences, whether it be gender, gender identification, race, age, disability, faith, or sexual orientation, experience in using various patient-specific software programs, and so much more. Personal development and performance is an important factor of the apprenticeship program and I've benefited greatly from the apprenticeship incorporating activity sheets for new learning, which tracked our progress on a monthly basis, reviews with the educator and the line managers to ensure we are progressing to the expected timetables and stages of the apprenticeship, meetings with the pastoral wellbeing educator who helped with concerns I had and provided guidance with job searches and interview techniques. COVID-19, like all walks of life, the pandemic had an effect on the apprenticeship. And although off-the-job learning came to a halt, we did have a virtual one-to-one -one support with the educators. Also, social distancing in the office environment meant that some of the shadowing and training had to be reduced. However, this has been a necessary life lesson in the apprentice's ability to adapt and have increased confidence in not being afraid of changes and challenges. Also, to be more self-reliant and proactive when completing the outstanding workbooks where we could not attend a face-to-face -face workshop. Finally, although there is no guarantee of a job at the end of the apprenticeship, I've been able to use the work experience gained and training received to enable me to have a fuller CV and work profile whilst looking for work that suits my NHS capabilities and experience. I've added confidence going into interviews, and I had one this morning actually, which I would not have had without doing the apprenticeship. And I certainly will not consider my age to being a barrier to achieving my goal of working for the NHS. In the meantime, the department have kept me on as bank staff and I was shortlisted for an interview and took part in that interview this morning, so fingers crossed. I have nothing but praise for the apprenticeship team, the apprenticeship team at the Trust and the NHS department are working. Both the team and department provide support that has contributed greatly to the increase in my self-confidence and personal development. So I definitely encourage anyone looking for a role in the NHS to check out the NHS Careers and NHS Jobs website. And if you think an apprenticeship would suit you, just to go for it. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Maureen, and congratulations on achieving your apprenticeship. And I wish you every success in your job searching now. I hope you find exactly what you're looking for. Um, it's a really lovely, inspiring story, and it just reinforces the message that apprenticeships are not just for young people, but can be for any of us at any age that want a career change. Um, and it's a fantastic route into a new role. So that's just a brilliant story. Um, it's my pleasure now to hand over to our next speaker, Yazir Iqbal. Um, Yazir is a project lead at Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. Over to you. 
Hi there, so my name is Yasser. So I'm currently the project lead for the Aspire project at Bedford Women's and Children's Hospital. The Aspire project was set up to help support those people interested in uh, creating the NHS um, opportunities to access different schemes. And what I'll do today is I'll talk about some of these schemes and opportunities available for those looking to start a career in the NHS. So Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital um, is quite a new organisation. So we merged about three years ago. And before that, we were two separate organisations and we're quite unique in the services we provide. Um, being a paediatric hospital and a women's hospital where we look after the um, birth of newborn babies and as a result of that, um, a lot of the jobs and roles and opportunities in our trust are quite unique. You won't necessarily find them in some of the other hospitals. We've also got an organisation called Forward Thinking Birmingham, which is our mental health services for young people. Um, and that is different sites started around the city. So quite a smaller organisation compared to some of my colleagues on here, but we do do a lot of quite specialist things. The next slide, please. So working at our hospital isn't just about doctors and nurses caring about the bedside. So there's a whole army of people who work together to help make a hospital the best it can be. Um, so from our radiographers, sonographers, clinical scientists, um, electricians, estate staff, everyone plays a vital role in making sure we provide the best care to our patients. So how do we do this? We focus on what our staff want to do and help them in doing that. We, we are also a teaching hospital, so we deliver our own apprenticeship programmes, we support the training of student nurses, student physiotherapists, and um, so there's a lot of opportunities within our organisations to develop yourself. We're also really passionate about listening to our staff and involving them in decisions, making the hospital and the organisation better for our patients. Next slide please. So we have a range of opportunities and I'm just going to touch on some of them today. So we offer traineeships, which I'll elaborate on a bit, which is almost like a pre-apprenticeship. We also offer apprenticeships. We've currently got over 150 apprentices um, at our organisation. I'm really passionate about supporting apprentices. For us, it's a lovely way to bring someone in to start um, the career in the NHS. And as a result of that, we're really, really um, good at keeping our apprentices. Um, over 90% of our apprentices retain at the end of the um, apprenticeship and get a job. We've also started virtual work experiences. So obviously with currently COVID-19, we were um, we had quite a large work experience programme which enabled young people, older adults to come and experience work. Um, but we've had to put that on hold at the moment. But we've started doing virtual work experience um placements and in february of next year we're doing a week-long uh, pro different programs that you can get involved in and um at the end of the slide i'll show our website where you can find out more information we also do various open days again we recently had to move these to virtual open days but we're always holding recruitment days where you can come along meet our staff explore the hospital and find out more next slide please so, one of the um, apprenticeships we offer is customer service. Customer service um, is a fantastic way for anyone who hasn't got much experience maybe in the workplace or is looking has looking for an entry role into the NHS. So this is a qualification that's offered at level two. And it can be in, in any department, so it could be our finance department, IT, it could be on of the wards as a receptionist. And it's a brilliant way for you to develop lots of personal skills like communication, information gathering, analysis. Um, the qualification is 15 months. You don't have to attend a college. So that's an added bonus of the way we deliver apprenticeships is that all your training takes place on site. That means throughout your apprenticeship, you get access to your assessors, access to teaching resources to help you develop. At the end of your customer service quali uh, qualification, there's a lot of support provided by our in-house career service team. So we have an on-site careers advisor who helps you make job applications, helps you um, prepare for your interview, to help you obtain a position and develop your career plan. And you can then go on and do further qualifications. You can do business admin level three, you can do management qualifications um, at degree level. 
And throughout the last few years, we've had a lot of apprentices continue to do many more qualifications. Thank you. So this is just an example of um, how somebody might progress by doing a level two. And um, often there used to be a misconception that oh, if I do an entry level qualification or an apprenticeship, there's nowhere for me to go. That isn't true. As you can see from this diagram, you can start off on a level two, then move on in a high level role where you might do a level three, level four qualification and might be working as a personal assistant, administrator. And you can go all the way up now up to level seven. So you do degree apprenticeships. So we've got many staff who started off at level two, level three apprenticeships are now actually into degree level qualifications, all funded and paid for by the hospital. Next slide, please. One of our most um, popular qualifications is our healthcare support worker qualification. So this is um, a role that offers you the opportunity to deliver direct personal care to um, our patients. And that could be working in therapy, it could be working as a midwifery, midwifery assistant, occupational therapy. And it's an excellent way for if you're looking to for a role where you want to provide care to your patients, or even if you're thinking about maybe going into nursing, it gives you the opportunity to develop the skills, qualities that you need to be successful in that role. So our healthcare support worker apprenticeship is 18 months. And one of the added benefits is that you get a permanent job from day one. So at the end of the apprenticeship, you still continue in your department. You don't have to apply for another job. Um, currently, we've got about 90 apprentices on this one alone, and it's continuing to grow. Can you go to the next slide, please? So as you can see from this diagram, there's opportunities for you to further develop your qualifications. And one of the qualifications that is the trainee nurse associate. We've had several of our apprentices who are now doing that qualification. The trainee nurse um, associate provides more care to patients, has more responsibility, and is more qualified. Um, some of our trainee nurse associates are now looking on to do the um, nursing apprenticeship. So if you were thinking about a career in nursing, but they don't want to go to university and wanted to look at how you could develop your experience and we're worried about paying the fees. An apprenticeship with a healthcare uh, assistant is the way, is an ideal, ideal for you. It gives you the chance to take a bit more time uh, learning and developing your skills, being employed by a world-class leading employer um, and the guarantee of a job at the end. Next slide, please. So some of the skills and qualities that you need for apprenticeships, good interpersonal skills, so you will be speaking to people of different backgrounds, different ages, and you need to be able to sort of communicate with them and mix with them. Understanding the requirement of confidentiality, that's really important because you will come across people who've got different illnesses, making sure you can handle sensitive information. You need good computer skills no matter what role you're doing, even if you're doing a healthcare role, you need to be able to use computer systems to pull up patients' reports and information. Being able to deal problems in a calm and efficient manner. So your hospital can be quite a stressful place. So it's really important that you're able to remain calm, be able to deal with something professionally. Time management is really important as well. And being caring and empathetic is really important. Um, you will come across people who are upset. And just being able to handle that is really important. So some of the qualifications, so they can vary from apprenticeships to apprenticeships. So for our customer service apprenticeship, you don't need any um, qualifications, but we do um, require you to have a good command of English and maths. However, for a healthcare apprenticeship, you must have English and maths. Um, always check the qualifications when you're applying. If you don't have the qualifications, then you might want to look at our traineeship program. Next slide. If you're not ready for an apprenticeship, so for example, you don't have your English or maths, or you're not sure what an apprenticeship is right for you, you might want to look at a traineeship program. So we've just launched um, a new traineeship program with Warsaw College, and we will be starting to put a program 
of the coming weeks for 10 students initially. So with this um, uh, uh, course, you would spend one day a week at college working on your English and maths and your employment skills, and then two days on placement in a cl clinical area. This isn't work experience, this is actual um, employment work where you'd actually be working with um, qualified professionals such as nurses, healthcare assistants, doctors, to provide patient care. At the end of the 10 weeks, you'll be supported then to apply for healthcare support work and apprenticeship. If you find at the end of it, this is absolutely what you want to do, um, you'll be given that opportunity. So it's almost like a try before you apply for an apprenticeship to give you that maybe a bit of confidence to make sure it's right for you. Um, and we'll be having quite a lot of these opportunities over the coming five months. Next slide, please. So as I finish, um, there's a poster on there. You might not be able to see it because it's not that clear, but it's just an example of someone who came through our apprenticeship program, um, Brody. So Brody came in doing an entry level business admin court, uh, qualification, more or less straight from school, wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but taught and tried the NHS because he'd heard loads. So Brody completed his level two qualification and while he was here, he was able to access other opportunities such as mentoring opportunities. Um, and at the end of that, he was supported into a permanent job and then completed his level three. He then continued to access further qualification and support and is now actually managing the team he actually started in. This was all inside three years. So he's someone who came from a school leaver to actually managing the team he started. And, and now he's looking to do a degree apprenticeship. So when you do an apprenticeship, the opportunities are endless. Um, it, I really encourage anyone to you know, really have a look and um, consider them. If you're interested, all the vacancies are on the NHS jobs. I also encourage you to have a look at our Aspire website on our on our hospital website. There's lots of resources um, and in details of events and things that you can access. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, lots of brilliant information and advice and guidance there around different entry routes into healthcare careers and fantastic to hear about the success that your apprentices achieve on qualification moving into job roles. That's that's brilliant. Um, I apologise that we're running a little over time, so I hope everybody will, will stay with us. We have two more fabulous speakers for you. So I'll pass you over to Geraldine Donworth, who's the Industry Manager for Healthcare and Childcare at City and Guilds. Thanks very much, Anne. Uh, could I have the next slide and the next one, please? Uh, what a fabulous um, array of, of speakers and some fantastic information, really inspiring stories there from, from everybody. So I just wanted to start, and, and you've heard this actually from the speakers, um, that healthcare jobs are not all about doctors, nurses and healthcare assistants. So that's obviously false. Um, working in healthcare does mean uh, working on social hours. True, false. It's true and false, I think. It depends It depends where you work and um, what you do. I posed a question here about can a healthcare assistant progress to be a registered nurse? Well, you've seen some illustrations already about how that's possible in, in healthcare, so the answer to that is yes. And um, the next question is about um, I'm not looking to work in healthcare as such. Are there still opportunities for me to work in the NHS? And of course, um, colleagues have answered that question as well today. So well done, everybody. Um, but the, the answer to that is yes, also. Next slide, please. So we've talked about some of the things that you need to work in healthcare. And as some of the opportunities are um, for people perhaps who haven't got any experience, whereas other opportunities you would need to have some experience to come straight into a, a particular role. There's something that binds everything together and that's around values and behaviours that are expected by um, a healthcare employer. And I spoke earlier this morning about social care employers and actually these, these also um, ring true for that for that particular sector as well. So, in order to be successful and be happy, I think in a in a career in in healthcare, um, you need skills such as being caring, being compassionate, being competent at what you do, and you would get support to reach that competence. Being able to communicate well with your colleagues and with patients. 
having the courage to do the job that you do and the courage to turn up on time and do the best job that you can do and be committed as well to um to the job that you do so that's what what um NHS and healthcare employers are, are, are looking for in a nutshell. Next slide, please. I actually borrowed some slides from Health Education England for this um, particular presentation because, again, I did want to talk about apprenticeships, but I also wanted to show the array of apprenticeships that have been completed or have been started in the NHS in the year 2018 to 2019. And you can see here, um, there's, there's a, a vast uh, range of apprenticeships from business administration, the nursing associates obviously is obviously very popular, that's very new and there's been a big push um, for starts around nursing associate, a fantastic opportunity for healthcare assistants to progress um, to either stay at nursing associate um, or, to, or to move on to registered nurse. Um, operations department manager, Customer service practitioner, which um, Yassi has talked about, healthcare science, advanced clinical practitioner, they're at level two right up to level seven. So you can imagine um, the, the opportunities that there are once you get into an apprenticeship in the NHS. Next slide, please. And here is that pathway. Um, again, it's a Health Education England um, slide. It was there, so I thought I'd use it. Um, looking at that entry at level two, perhaps someone with, with no experience coming in, carrying out that, um, starting your career pathway there at level two, carrying out your apprenticeship. And if you want to stay at that level, that's absolutely fine. Many people want to do do their first job and actually stay there. They enjoy that job. There's no, there's no um, compulsion at all to have to progress, but actually the opportunities are there. So if you're interested, you can carry on. And so you can take that in smaller steps. So moving from a level two to a level three in a senior healthcare role, um, a support worker role. And those roles are quite varied depending on which department um, that, that you're working in. So you could be working um, with children, young people on the children's ward in the children's hospital, or you could be working in theatre, um, uh, in, in theatre support, for example, or with adults in a, um, in a ward. Moving on from that to nursing associate and then the registered nurse. So that pathway is absolutely defined. That's, we can go on to the next slide, please, because I'll just carry on talking. Um, I think we've, we've done a bit of myth busting this morning about um, the opportunities that there are to progress in the NHS when you get in there, um, entering at different kinds of levels. But also this, this slide um, summarises some of the different opportunities that there are to work in, in healthcare. So, you know, we, we've already heard we need chefs, we need pharmacy technicians, we need people to maintain the property and, and um, maintain the buildings that are, that are there in, in the trusts. We need people who are working in administration roles and in IT and finance. There are so many opportunities. As somebody said earlier, it's like looking at a small town, isn't it? And thinking about, well, what is it I want to do? But could I do that in the NHS? And I think, you know, in many, many cases, the answer is obviously yes. So um, next slide, please. Could you give me my next slide? Thank you. So, um, here on this slide, I've just tried to summarise from where people might enter into the NHS. So pre-employment, what might you think about looking at in terms of before I get a job in the NHS? And uh, Yassir was, was discussing um, the fact that some of the roles actually do require a, a, a level of maths and English um, achievement and, and ability before starting into those roles. So maybe for some of you, that's where you, you, you would need to start in actually building up your skills around maths and English, uh, perhaps by um, taking some functional skills um, programmes or looking at a level one 
um, qualification which uh, which might be accessed through your local college um, so that you can have a think about um, the kinds of work that you might like to do whilst um, doing an education programme and perhaps onto a traineeship or apprenticeship. And then the, the, the other parts of this um, diagram just uh, lay out the apprenticeship opportunities which are in healthcare or leadership um, moving along from level two uh, right up to level five and beyond so that we are looking at opportunities to progress through that route right up to degree level and to become a registered professional such as a nursing associate or a, a physiotherapist so you know all of those opportunities are there I actually think that's me done now but um yeah okay thank you thank you very much Geraldine that was brilliant and um, to see very clearly the steps that people can follow in the pathway progressing from no qualifications through the functional skills and then on to um, level two level three and so on so there really are you know a million different career opportunities um, and looking at all those different jobs that you highlighted it's um yeah lots of myth busting today um, so our final speaker this morning um, i'm delighted to introduce luke azard who is a relationship manager at the national career service over to you luke Luke, you're on mute. Sorry, rookie mistake. Um, my name's Luke um, and I work for an organisation called Prospects um, and we deliver the National Career Service contract across the West Midlands. Bring up the next slide. And our service is open to anybody who is 19 plus. So it doesn't matter if you're 19, 75, unemployed, employed, under threat of redundancy, on furlough, it doesn't matter. It's open to everybody 19 plus. And we're here to give professional careers guidance around which direction you wish to move in the future um, and what opportunities are out there that are available. So you've heard about loads of different opportunities today in the health and social care sector and it might be for you establishing which is the right path for you to take and that's the sort of area that we would support you with to make sure that you make the right decisions for you. Obviously there's a there's a lot of changes that happen at the moment due to the pandemic and certain sectors are struggling and other sectors are thriving and there could be transferable skills that you've got from the sector you're in that can translate to health and social sector or other roles that might be flourishing at the moment which is going to give you job security moving into and potentially give you a new career direction to focus on and the support we offer isn't just a case of you come and you have a one-to-one -one support with us or you attend an event with us and that's it it's ongoing support so even if we supported you into a job and you started that job while you're in that job you can still be in touch with us and get support if you need it it might be while you're in that job you realize there's certain skills you haven't got that you want to do some training which we can put you in the right direction of whatever the training is and put you in contact with organizations that can deliver that so you're upskilling within the role so it's just a, very much about making sure that you're on the right path for the direction that you're looking to take next slide please so, so some of the services we offer in terms of how we can support like i mentioned it's about careers advice in general and supporting you with a career change it's potentially supporting you with effective job searching so if there are specific roles that you're looking for there's certain websites that are better to go on to find roles within specific sectors instead of just trawling job site after job site it's identifying those transferable skills that will move across that will be adaptable to new sectors that you haven't worked in before and just identifying what your skills are in general because people can sell themselves short a lot of people have a lot of skills when you ask them they'll say no i don't really have any skills everyone has skills and it's identifying them and, and giving you the confidence and motivation to apply them to a potential new sector using social media to find um, jobs that's where a lot of jobs are advertised at the moment I've said about completing application forms and personal statements preparing you for interviews 
obviously interviews are changing now because they're not necessarily face to face. They could be done on this platform where it's through Teams. So it's not just the interview itself. It could be making sure that you know how to download the software. You know how to mute yourself and mute yourself, which I obviously just didn't do. Um, and also how to share your screen. So if you're doing an interview where you've got to do a presentation, you need to know how to do those sort of things as well now. And I think it's important that people understand just because it's not face to face, you still need to dress appropriately if you're going to be on a screen and not just in your casuals. So it's things that you might take for granted, but that we would like to support you with making sure you're prepared properly. And you've heard about apprenticeships today. Um, and obviously there are so many different apprenticeships available. So we're here to, to talk to you about what apprenticeship it may be that's more suitable for you, how you go about applying for those apprenticeships if you're interested. We can also support with voluntary work if it's a case of you're, you're thinking of getting into another sector but you're not sure yet and you would like to just do a bit of voluntary work to see if it is for you, then that's something we can support with as well. Um, we can support with courses, um, and just in general, really, we're not the experts in everything. So it's a case of if we, if, if you need specific support and we can't give you that information, we will signpost you to the stakeholders and agencies and the experts that can and make sure that you're given the information, the correct information to speak to those people. Next slide, please. And we are delivering a specific follow on event to both the sessions today, just touching on health and social care in general, where we will have some organisations coming on where you can ask them specific questions you might have about the sector. So there's a bit of time for question and answers, which you haven't have been able to have today. Um, and also for us to talk through, if you've got to prepare your CV for a certain opportunity, how to adapt it accordingly and not just using the same CV for every opportunity talking through how the how interviews are prepared for health and social care roles to give you a better understanding of how to approach an interview effective use of job boards again job applications and we've mentioned it a couple of times today but um also talking through myth busting because people do have perceived ideas about what the industry might be like what vacancies they can they might be able to apply for so Again, it's, it's just any additional questions that people might have that we can put those myths to rest, and that's what we can focus on. Um, the invitation to the event will be sent to everybody, so please check your emails. And if you are interested, it'll tell you how to apply. Um, it would just be a case of sending us an email with your name, contact number, and just what area of the West Midlands you live. And then we will make sure an advisor gets in touch and send you a link to the event. If you would like additional support from us, but you're not interested in attending the event, then that's absolutely fine. Just contact us via the same method that you will receive via email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, that's fabulous. And it's been, I, I feel inspired after the last 60 minutes or so. And I just want to say huge thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we've heard some from some fantastic local employers around the range of opportunities they're offering um, and from, from Jason and Luke talking about prospects and the Prince's Trust and the various types of support that they can offer. So there's a wealth of advice and guidance. Um, I hope you will come forward with any questions um, and the team at West Midlands Combined Authority will be happy to help. Or you can always contact any of the organisations directly that have participated and somebody will be able to respond um, with any of your, your questions. So thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Thank you for bearing with us. I know we've run over time, but the, uh, the wealth of information that's been provided has been um, really worth, worthwhile. So um, yeah, it remains to me to say thank you very much and have a, a great rest of the day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.